inside him there's no other Give thanks to the Lord Oh, my name. 
All right, blessings to all of you. It's so good to be together right now. Some of you are joining us for the first time. I'm Pastor Terry Lee, pastor here at Cornerstone Church in San Francisco. And I'm so excited because today we are starting a new series. It's called Afterlife. And uh, it's meant to be an exploration of life in all dimensions. I mean, life now in Christ Jesus and then life to come because of Jesus. And we're going to talk about heaven and the relentless love of God. That's something that I'm really looking forward to all of us just sitting with. And now for some of you uh, who are joining us, maybe, like I said, for the first time, or at least maybe the first time in a long time, we have been exploring since actually the, the year's opening in our Healthy Love series, the famous love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. And it's often read at weddings and appreciated for its concise and poetic description of love. But it was meant to be so much more than a, a literary ornament. It was meant to be lived and implemented. It was given to remind us of what healthy love looks like and what happens naturally when the life of Christ is at work in us. And how that reality, if we're willing to embrace it or be embraced by it, can impact our lives, can impact our self-understanding, can impact our relationships and our relational capacity and and like we're going to see, can impact our future. In other words, healthy love shows up when his life flows in us, his love flows out. When his life flows in, his love flows out. It's as natural as fruit on a tree, a spiritual law of gravity. So what I'd like to do is revisit the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 13 and, and use it as a bridge for our new series. So it's going to be a connector with Easter right in the middle, connecting it all together. But I'm super excited. Afterlife, here we come. And even now, Lord, I just pray for your blessing over what we're about to share as we begin to read your word. I ask that it would just come alive in us, that you would speak to us, help us to enjoy this time but also to learn from it. That's my prayer. Strengthen us in your name, I pray. Amen. First Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. And here's what love is. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then when we get to verse eight, and you're going to see the connection, it starts out with this love never ends. That's the way the ESV renders it. Another version, the message renders it. Love never dies. And how appropriate is that coming off of and, and for Easter and just, I mean, I just, again, want the Lord to just speak to us because this is our first Sunday after Easter Sunday and how grateful we are for the love that never dies, right? For his never ending love, a love that is even now calling to us, calling us, if we can hear his voice by name. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm calling this message God's never ending love story because Easter Sunday which celebrates the resurrection of Jesus is the vindication of love. It, it's the key chapter in God's never ending love story, because listen, with, with, without it, without the resurrection, without Easter, the life and death, the ministry and the cross have no meaning, right? It, 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 it's so important without Easter's empty tomb, 
The cross is only a tragedy. The last testimony, the last ignominious, ignominious yeah, gasp of a, of a dying man, a deluded man. When Jesus was on earth, you know, he made claims. Not only did he claim to show us the way to live and love and modeled that for us, but he claimed to be God's only son sent from heaven above. I think that's worth saying one more time. Not only did he show us the way to live in love, he claimed to be God's only son sent from above. He claimed to have come from heaven to earth. Yeah. So he could take us from earth to heaven. And that's not a small claim. It's huge. It's huge. For one, it presupposes that there is a heaven to be gained. I mean, think about it. Jesus talked about it as reality. The life to come is reality. He did not say it was just something that, you know, is a nice thing to mollify our fears in this life, but not really anything that is going to be, <laughs> you know, something that awaits us. He, he was not trying to talk about heaven and the life to come as a technique. He was talking about it as a future destination for all of us who would put our trust and hope and confidence in him. And that's huge, right? So it not only presupposes that there's a heaven to be gained, but it also reminds us that there is a non-heaven, that's how I'm putting it, a hell, to be avoided. So there's a heaven to be gained and there's a non-heaven to be avoided. But, and that you know, has everything to do with what we do with Jesus. It does. Eternity with him, eternity without him. The choice is ours. And my prayer is that we, we would make that choice for Jesus and never deviate in our commitment to him. And by the way, if, if you have never asked the Lord into your life and you want to do that and you want to have someone pray with you, let us know. I mean, we want to be a partner with you so that you can share in this never ending love story as well. But for those of us who have opened up our hearts to Jesus, let's, let's stay with him. Uh, but like I mentioned, I want to shift back in time. I want to go to the third chapter of John because Jesus in that third chapter of the gospel of John is locked in a conversation with a highly trained and intellectual man about spiritual things. The man's name is Nicodemus. The conversation they are having secretly in the night, I might add, as a, as a safeguard, uh, to Nicodemus's uh, reputation. I don't know, with his peers? I guess that's a way of saying it. Because Nicodemus's contemporaries view Jesus with suspicion. But it's out of that conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus that we are given what is probably, well, it's the most famous and certainly the most quoted verse in all the Bible. And I think some of you already know what I'm talking about. But let's jump into the conversation and I'll show you specifically what I mean. John 3, and this is from the NLT version. There was a man named Nicodemus, who was a Jewish leader, who was a Pharisee. Uh, after dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, teacher, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. And Jesus re replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, my friend, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You will not be able to comprehend what God is doing right in front of your eyes. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and of the spirit, natural and spiritual birth. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? How are things, these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you do not understand these things? 
I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven in return, but but the Son of Man, Jesus talking about himself here, he's come down from heaven. I wouldn't have said that if Jesus didn't. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Jesus is foretelling of the cross, isn't he? As the healing of the world, the healing of the nations. So that everyone who believes in him, Jesus is speaking about himself as the Son of Man, the representative human being sent by God. If anyone believes in him, they will have eternal life. And then here it is. Here's the verse. You, you know what? You see it in its context, it's beautiful. For this is how God loved the world. As Jesus looks into the eyes of Nicodemus, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. The world was already dying. He came to give us life. You know, I've always marveled that we owe this amazing verse, this recorded statement to the honest question of a seeker named Nicodemus. <laughs> like, if it wasn't for Nicodemus asking the question, coming to Jesus in the secrecy of the night to have this conversation, we would have never been given these words. They're remarkable, beautiful life-giving words. And it's a reminder of everything that Jesus has come to do, isn't it? To give his life to pay a price for us that we can never pay for ourselves so that we might have a life that never ends, life without end after this life, the life that is truly life now and forever. That, my friends, is the promise of Easter. That is the Easter gift. Can't earn it, don't deserve it, but it's ours if we will receive it, right? Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Wow. Can't earn a gift, just receive it. And you know, the other thing that we see here is that God doesn't mind our honest questions. He's even fine with us coming to him in the night. Nicodemus was a little reluctant to be seen with Jesus, wasn't he? Lest he be cast as a simpleton. Perhaps some of us can relate to that a little bit. Our vocational or educational or professional circles, the places where we work, or especially those who are in the tech uh, or biotech or scientific world or you spend a lot of your time at college or at university, you may find that you're in an environment where there is an aggressively dismissive attitude towards Christianity, seeing it almost and unfortunately through a political lens. Or, or they may, in a desire for equity or social e equality, sense that Jesus and the Bible are, uh, I don't know how to say it, countercultural and to a degree incompatible with where dominant culture is on issues, issues like identity, sexuality, and marriage, for example. I mean, the teaching of Jesus and the scriptures uh, kind of run counter to the narrative of our culture right now. And so people who we work with or who are connected to our circles, uh, they may not understand even uh, because they've never actually heard it, shared it in a, in a way that makes sense to them, uh, or they, they may not be able to appreciate uh, our rationale. Uh, I'm talking about for those of us who believe in Jesus and, this, and the scriptures as a way of life, a way of being. Like that's the, the primary lens through which we interpret our world is through the love of God and the scriptures because that's what Jesus taught us, right? In my words, they are spirit and they are life. I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I mean, everything that Jesus teaches us is that we are to live by his words, like God's word. 
And sometimes even, even our moral convictions that are based on his words can be confusing. And so I guess, again, the connection here was with Nicodemus, who was in a situation not unlike what many of us find ourselves in. And so what are we, what are we, <laughs> what are we supposed to do in such a divergent or maybe I put it this way, hostile environment to faith, to real Christian faith, right? To articulated Christian faith. Uh, there, and there's obviously degrees of, of hostility, and I'm not trying to create something that if it, if it isn't there, if there is no hostility, that's fantastic. If there's the freedom to be able to discuss openly our faith and even um, the way in which we seek to honor the, the teachings of Scripture, Jesus, the New Testament, the church. Uh, a lot of times there's a, a great spirit of accommodation, but the other times that's not the case. And Nicodemus found himself in a situation where uh, he was reluctant to make known his admiration for Jesus. So, you know, what do we do? when we find ourselves in a situation like that. For some people, the answer is easy. It's so, like their answer is never, ever be ashamed of Jesus. Because they will say, we will say, Jesus said that if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. So like the Apostle Paul who said in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. So for some, the answer is, is clear. Well, I must never be ashamed of Jesus. But, you know, instead, uh, be loving, but also open about faith and willing to be a light in a dark world. As Jesus taught us, a letter of light so shine before men, before people, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So the question is asked, I mean, if, if I'm ashamed of Jesus, if I don't stand up and talk about my convictions based upon the teachings of the scriptures, uh, then how will people know? So it, it's kind of more of a black and white approach to how we represent the Lord in a countercultural way. But for others, if I can say this, and you need to hear me in, in, the, I hope in the most, uh, kind light, uh, for others, though, it's a more nuanced. We may feel uh, more insecure in our capacity to defend uh, a, a faith in Jesus, like in our, in our moral beliefs that are connected to that faith. And we may feel, uh, just because of the environment we find ourselves in, overwhelmed by the pressure to conform, even though we may disagree you know, or we may be like Nicodemus, <laughs> I mean, literally genuinely intrigued and drawn to Jesus, but reluctant to let it be known because of the potential cost uh, or ah, potential ridicule that may be connected to it. You know, peer, peer pressure, peer pressure is powerful and it's real. And so um, I understand that. I, I do believe it's better to walk alone than with a crowd going in the wrong direction. Like I, as Wadsworth wrote, uh, habit rules the unreflecting herd. I mean, to just go along because it's the in thing to do or the politically correct thing to do, that's, that doesn't necessarily honor the Lord. But I want to say something more. There is something else that should encourage us here a week removed from Easter day. And as we talk about the afterlife and I really want to just sit with this because this is what I told us we were going to do. We we're going to talk a little bit about heaven and, and what is to come. But I, I just, I don't know. I was touched by this, that the Lord was fine meeting Nicodemus where he was. Think about it. Jesus even accommodated Nicodemus's hesitance. So I just, I just want to say this, that if you think about it, the Lord could have said, Hey, Nicodemus. Hey, Nick. <laughs> if you're ashamed of me to be seen with me in daylight because of your fear for losing your reputation in the eyes of your peers, hey, listen, you're on your own. But Jesus didn't say that. He, 
He said, Nick, you're going <laughs> to you're gonna come to me at night. Wow. Nick at night. The Lord's love is, uh, it's, just, it's just magnanimous, isn't it? Incredibly, God meets all of us where we are. It's what he does. Oh, and there's one more thing. He will work with us to find him, to learn and to understand who he is and what he has come to do for us and in us. How appreciative, how thankful I am for that. You know, relationship with Jesus is not as much about intelligence or education or knowledge. Nicodemus had all those things, but he still struggled with spiritual intelligence. If I could say it that way, he had a hard time understanding what Jesus was saying, especially about the, the born again thing. It just didn't make sense to him. But again, it, it, it reminds us that the way of the Lord is the way of the open hand in a child's heart. It must be received before it can be, to use the imagery of Jesus, conceived. So it's not how smart we are. It's not how good we are. It's not how spiritual we are or even religiously informed. It's how open we are and willing to receive what Jesus has for us. This is the way of the open hand. You know, I, I have to come with him open. That's why Jesus talked about the child's heart. Again, it must be received before it can be conceived. An eternal relationship with Jesus. Yes, you heard me right. And I'm not sure I've ever actually quite said it that way before, but an eternal relationship with Jesus was made possible when Jesus rose from the grave and conquered death once and forever. It was the key moment in God's never ending love story because it made the cross meaningful and secured for us, you and me and whoever would receive and believe a life beyond this life. One more time. Remember, maybe I, I should just quote it one more time for God. So loved this world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, would not die, would not live as, as Dallas Willard called it a futile and you know, meaningless life, but that we would experience the undying life of Jesus because <sighs> eternal life, because as Jesus taught us, he said, God did not send his son, him, him into this world to condemn the world. The world already has on it the, the sentence of death. It's broken. We die. That's just reality. And our world is filled with contradictions and violence and despair and anxious thoughts. I mean, it's just, it, with all of its beauty, it, it has so much that is damaged. And Jesus said, I didn't send, I didn't, God did not send his son into this world to condemn it, but the world through him might be saved. You know, someday we will come to the end of our earthly journey. I will. I actually have thought about this a lot. And what will the next life be like? <sighs> Some of the things that we read in the Bible seem hard to fathom, but I suppose if we can connect back to the teaching of Jesus, it's no different than leaving the womb. And so from time to time in our private moments, we may sit with Nicodemus and say, well, how, how can these things be? Right, I found myself there more than a few times. Like, I know what you talked about, Lord, about what is to come about a timeless existence that's you know, flourishing in your love, endless creativity, endless expansion, endless joy, uh, a place devoid of sin, brokenness and harm I, and pain. I, I, I kind of understand that, you know, but it just sometimes seems incredible. Like, how can these things be like Nicodemus? I feel like saying the same thing. Maybe you've said it that way. You know, no one has gone to heaven and returned, but the son came from heaven to get us to heaven. And someday he will return. That's what he taught us. 
most of us won't live to see that day. We won't be alive when it happens, when the reality of Jesus makes its way known in a physical way into our time and space. But we are going to be present with God. That's what Jesus taught us. And what we've done with him will make the, dis- the difference, all the difference in the world and the life that is to come. You know, Jesus was God's rescue mission. We must never forget that. I have come, Jesus said, to pay a ransom. I have come that you might have life. I have come to give my life away so that you might have life. Unending day. But, you know, so, so we... <laughs> so we've been rescued. If the world, Jesus died to rescue the world. And if we receive him, if we receive, if we're willing to receive that rescue, if we're willing to get into the boat, as it were, like God won't make us do it. It's a choice that we get to make. Like I can, I can choose to receive his rescue. He died to make that rest. He died and rose to make that rescue possible. But I do want us to remember this one thing, and I've heard, I've heard it, I've never forgotten it. If, you know, Jesus came to rescue us, and once you've been rescued, you're on the rescue team. Once you've been rescued, you're on the rescue team. That's just the, that's the assignment we all are given. It's not just to get us to heaven. It's to help us become part of helping others to find their way to heaven as well. We're not just rescued to say that I'm rescued. I do say that. We are rescued to be part of a rescue team. So let's share Jesus. Come on. That's what we've been called to do. His life shining through our lives. After life is just the bonus to the real life that is now given to us. Ah, Maybe that's not even the best way to say it. Maybe the life that is to come, the afterlife, is going to be more important than the life which is. But after our life is affected by Jesus in this life, the promise of that effect lingers into the next one. So with that in mind, I just, you know, I just want to remind all of us. Uh, and yeah, every now and then I'll, I'll do this. I want to say it because it's important to me. It's important to us as a church family. It's important to us as a, a, a band of believers. And, and I'm going to say this, you know, because in a minute we're going to share a song. And, and uh, it's a kind of close worshiping moment that just allows us to sit and let some of the principles and ideas that we've explored together settle in. And then I'll come back around with a little bit of a benediction, a, a final little piece to share and bless you with. But I do want to remind everybody about our giving time because it's very important that if we live with an eternal perspective, that we do not lay up for ourselves treasures just on this earth and, and they'll perish and that's it. But to lay up, Jesus said, treasure in heaven. And I think what we do with our resources actually can have a double, double benefit, both in this life and in the next. Jesus reminded us to be rich towards God. And so I want to remind the church right now And I'm not trying to force anybody to do this. I'm inviting you into a place of covenantal relationship with the Lord as it comes to generosity, but specifically as it comes to giving. Many of us are committed to honoring Jesus in our tithe as he taught us. Um, These things ought you to have done, Matthew 23, 23. And when we honor him with our tithe, when we honor him with our offerings, when we honor him with our giving, it it creates a kind of breakthrough place in our lives that allows God to move in dimensions that I think would otherwise be closed. So with that in mind, remember, you can give. I'm not, I just want to make the invitation and the reminder to invest in the best. Remember, you can give, you can send that into our offices. That's the traditional way, I suppose. You can give through our website directly. You can go through our app. That's what I do, the Cornerstone SF app. It's a wonderful way to give. But like I always say, first, let us give him our heart. So with that in mind, let's share this time together in song, and then I'll come back around. Here we go.
this forever My song will be you I'm living in freedom You've taken my burdens away Oh Jesus forever My song will be you Only for you cross that you bore and the debt that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave this is the reason i sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason i sing Testify of your grace, Jesus forever. My song will be you, only for you. For the cross that you bore and the debt that you paid, for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason I sing. So good, so You're so good to me. You're so good, so good. You're so good to me. Forever I will sing. You're so good to me. For the cross that you bore and the death that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave this is the reason i sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me oh this is the reason i sing for the cross that you bore and the death that you paid for the victory you won over death and the grave this is the reason i sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason i sing oh Yes, Lord, you're the, you're the reason that we sing. You're the reason that I sing and our heart is so full of praise, grateful for the love, grateful for the love that never quit and the life that we have that is yet to come because Jesus' love didn't quit. Jesus was God's rescue mission. I think it's worth me saying that one more time. And he wants us to remember that once you've been rescued, you're on the rescue team. That means we've all been called to, to help rescue others. Not on the sidelines, we're part of the team. Who are we supposed to be praying for? Who are we supposed to be inviting? Who are we supposed to be sharing this message with? Who are we to help rescue? That's the good news. That he's come to save. And we get to be part of that never ending love story. 
You're so blessed. You're so loved. Go in His goodness. Go in His grace. In His name I pray. Amen.